And uh, the next thing that came into my mind is how do we sustain the momentum? Because we have moments when God blesses us and we quickly shut up every other thing and we say now God has done it, we will wait until he does it again. Then we fail to realize that God doesn't do it for us to be contented with what he's done. Actually, God does it to move us to the next level. And as Pastor Simon has mentioned to us here, we have a focus. And that focus, we will end it when Jesus comes. So I began asking, what can I really share with the church? And the Lord gave me a word here to encourage you. In fact, this morning, I'm simply encouraging you. And I hope you receive the word of exhortation to encourage you. He simply told me to speak to you about when God is present with you. When God is present with you. I'm not talking about the presence of God that we hiss or would nahisi when we are in the service here, no. I'm talking about when God walks with you and God is present with you. That's the scripture, that's the word God gave to me to encourage you. To let you know that you will continue to sustain momentum in your spiritual life. Members of GCI, you'll continue to sustain momentum in the blessings God has given you. And in those promises God has given to you, if you allow his presence to be continually present with you. That's the word God gave to me. Contentment is not our language. And we are not going to be satisfied with the small, small things which God is doing in our lives. We want to believe God when we reach one step, we move to the next. And we yearn for it. We cry for it. We seek it. We look for it. We seek it with the whole of our hearts. That is the prayer I have for myself and for you that is here today. So the scripture that God gave me was Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 up to verse 9. Verse 5 to verse 9. And I want to trust God who will build on this scripture in the days to come, especially any of us who comes to stand here and speak. Build momentum in everybody who comes to this church. Build momentum. This scripture has been spoken here again and again. And I even remember during the conference, there is someone who quoted it. But I'm going to look at it from a different angle. That is Joshua 1, verse 5 up to verse 9. If you can turn there with me, I will appreciate you doing that. Please help me read together with me. It says, there, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I hope you're with me. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Then he says, be strong and of a good courage. For unto these people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto your fathers to give to them. Not only be thou strong and ve uh, uh, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou may, may that, uh, courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Then he says, Stand not from me to the right hand or to the left hand that thou mayest prosper where with us forever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. That is the Bible that we read. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. And then thou shalt, have, thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Then I want you to read the last verse of that, of that, of that, of that verse. It says, when he says dismayed, he says what? For the Lord, can we read it together? For the Lord, thy God, is with thee, with us forever. Thou God. Can we repeat it again? For the Lord, your God, is with thee, with us forever. Thou goest. That is the word for us. The Lord, your God, is with you wherever, whither. I like it in, in the King James. Somebody says it is always anointed, eh, King James. So that word there, with, with us or ever. If I could use the, 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 the correct English, which we know all of us. The Lord, your God, is with you wherever thou goest. Wherever you go. Now, these words were spoken by none other than Moses. And this word, these words were being spoken to Joshua. I think we've spoken about that again and again. I need not go into details of that. Moses has reached a point where he has finished his course. Okay? 
and he has delivered the word to Joshua. And he's telling Joshua, now Joshua, take over from me and continue with what has remained before you. Let me tell you, the work that Joshua was going to do wasn't going to be an easy job. Joshua was meant to inherit the children of Israel, the land which God was giving them. This year, as we all know, our topic has been gaining more territory. Actually, this was the task Joshua was given. To be able to take Israel into the promise that God had given to them and apportion the land to them. I can tell you it was not as easy as many of us may think or believe. Because in our thinking, we think it was simply going to be a walkover in that land and, begin and, 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 and inherit it. No, it was not going to be very easy. Moses, the man whom God had said, let my people go. The man whom God had given the mantle to move Israel from Egypt was coming to the close of his chapter, the close of his uh, assignment. And I'm looking at Joshua, this young man, who was simply one in the crowd, like I would put it. He was not an elder. He was not among the Levites that we know, but simply a leader picked from among the crowd when they were going to spy the land out there. Simply a spanner boy who was carrying the bag that Moses had. I always view Joshua as the man who was carrying the jar that contained the water that, that Moses would use when he's going to the mountain. Carrying the, the horn that he would blow when he's coming down from the mountain. I'm seeing this young man being there for Moses whenever Moses needed assistance. Whom I would simply call as an assistant, someone who is there to simply do the donkey work that many of us don't want to do. And then God calls Moses on the mountain with him. And he tells Moses, Moses, from today, you are dying. I find it very strange that God can tell you you are dying and I'm giving you, I'm giving you a portion to this one. I think if God told me that, I'll, re I'll resist. I won't accept that. Then he tells him, Josh, Moses, you are dying, but this young man who is beside you is the one who will take these children to the land which I'm giving to them. I don't think Joshua at any point coveted that position. He must have been very afraid of that. Very, very afraid of that. Because he never knew how to work miracles, I can tell you. He had, he had never done even a single miracle in his life. All he would do was simply carry the bag for the man of God. You know, in the church we have people here whom nobody knows. I was saying last Sunday, there are certain things happening in church people don't know they're happening. But there are people who are very silent in church and you will never know what is going on behind their silence. There are people here who carry our bags. All right? When you look at them, they look like very useless people because all they can do is carry your bag for you. Some of them, you will see them bringing water for you. Some of them will be going for errands for you. And we do not consider those are the people that God wants to use. Sometimes we don't think about that. This was Joshua here. So he tells Joshua, you are the man who is going to inherit these people, the land which God is giving to them. Then he gives him the charge to go ahead and do that. Now, these scriptures we have written, you will see God speaking to Joshua more than three times. And in all cases, he is encouraging Joshua. And I want to encourage you this afternoon. God is with you. Ah, yes. oh, you didn't hear me. My word for you, even if you forget everything I'm preaching, is that God is with you. Yes. If not, God will be with you. So three times he encouraged Joshua. And three times he tells him, be courageous, be courageous, be of good courage. Somebody tells me, theologians will tell me, when, whenever verily, verily is used, or whenever it is spoken three times, it is a, it's, it's something very serious. Am I right? God never speaks only once. When he speaks twice or three times, he's very serious about it. So he tells Joshua, don't be afraid. The task ahead of you is very heavy, but don't relent. You have not yet gotten the land which God is giving to you. But I want you to know, even as I have spoken, it's going to be your land. But you must be courageous. Are you listening to me? I know there are people here who have been believing God for things in their lives. And even after this conference, some of us, we are so hyped in the conference, that after the hype that we had, we may look back and we may say, will God ever do it? I want to encourage you this morning. You need to know God will give you the ability to do it. I'm believing God for something in my life. I'm believing God. I'm believing God to use me in a manner that he has never used me before. You might not see it, but God is going to do it. I'm believing God to do something in my life which I've been yearning for. And I, I want to assure you this morning, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And don't be contented with what, you know, with what you have. Don't sit back and say, oh, he spoke. No, we must carry the baton and continue to the next level. 
But Joshua needed that encouragement here. God tells Joshua, listen, don't be afraid. I will be with you. And more than three times, he gave him a promise. And that's the promise I want to talk about here. The promise was simple. Joshua, you cannot make it on your own. In other words, you can never sustain momentum on your own. Let me tell you, church, whatever God has done in your life, you must continue gaining momentum. It may not matter how many blessings you've enjoyed in the last few weeks or how many prophecies have been given to you in the last many days or how much you, you, you've enjoyed the message God has given to you. You must continue to gain momentum. And the only way you can do it is to have the assurance in your heart and the assurance in your mind that I am not walking this walk alone. God is with me. So three times he mentioned, he says, so I will be with thee. Then he says, as I was with Moses, so shall I also be with you. Again, he repeated, he says, don't be afraid. Be, be, be strong and very courageous. Then he says, for the Lord your God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. I may not know how far you, where you want to go, how far you want to go. I don't know. I don't know which place you want to go. I, I'm saying to me myself here, it doesn't matter wherever. It is, could be in the marketplace. It could be in your ministry. It could be in your family. It could be in your marriage. It could be in anything that you are yearning God for, where you want to go. The word of God for you is that God will be with you wherever, wheresoever thou goest. That is the only way we'll be able to continue to receive the things which God has actually promised us to. I will be with you. God will partner with you. Now, in the Bible, there are very few people in Scripture who understood the presence of God. Remember, I told you this. I said in the beginning, this sermon, I'm calling it, when God is present with you. And when I talk about presence here, I'm not talking about the things you feel when you're in the service. No. Uh, the, 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 the young men were leading the, the service here. And uh, for me, I'm emotional sometimes. Eh? I try to tune in. Eh? Then I feel something. Oh, I don't know about you. Do you sometimes feel something? Especially when you are, you, you're, you're worshipping. You know? You feel it, and then tears begin just rolling down your cheeks nicely, and you feel good. All right? I'm not talking about that type of feeling. We, 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 we confuse that with the presence of God. We say, oh, I felt the presence of God in my life. It is a temporary feeling that comes. But what I'm talking about is you holding the hand of God and walking with him. What God was telling Joshua here is this. He was saying, listen, Joshua, I was with Moses when he left the wilderness to go and deliver Israel. My hand was holding his hand. And I want you to know, Joshua, even as he dies, as he goes, I will literally hold my hand with you and I will walk with you wherever you are going as you take the land. This is what the church needs. We need men and women who will walk with God. Whether you are sitting in your office, you are sitting with God. When you are on the table in the house, you are sitting with God. When you are walking on the streets of Nairobi, you know God is holding your hand and is walking with you. And I know in the Bible, not many people can have that kind of an experience. The only man in scripture whom I realize that walked with God is a man called Enoch in the Bible. Enoch. We, we don't have much about, I have not even had a message on Enoch. They just mentioned to him in the scripture because there isn't much we know about Enoch. But the only thing we know about Enoch, the Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was without. In other words, Enoch, God would come every morning and he would hold the hand of Enoch and they would be walking. Every time they were walking with God on earth. Walking. And then God would tell Enoch, see you tomorrow. And he would retreat in heaven. And then one day God came and he told Enoch, I want to take you for a walk. To see where I normally come from when I come to walk with you down here. Then he took Enoch with him to heaven. When Enoch reached there, he said, I'm not coming back. And that was the, the end of the chapter. So nobody knows where Enoch was buried. They don't know what happened to him, but we know he walked with God and he was without. God took him and he disappeared there. Can I pray that this morning you walk with God? But don't, don't go there and, and, and hang there, okay? All right? Now, this word, I'm using this to give you an example. Walking with God is basically being in the presence of God every time. And doing whatever God wants you to do because his presence is with you. The Apostle Paul speaks about that. And he says, if God is for us, in the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 31 to verse 32, could we read that together? Romans 8, 31 and 32. He says, what shall we say then to these things? I don't know what Paul was talking about when he was talking about things. But if you read the Bible, you will see Paul had expressed some of the things he had gone through, the pains he had gone through. 
some of the situations he had suffered, some of the things that he knew as a minister of the gospel or as a man of God he would face in life. Then he concludes by saying, what shall we say to these things? Please help me read this. He says what? If God... Could you read with me? He says what? If God be for us, then who? Who can be against us? In other words, when God is working with you, there is nothing that you cannot be able to do. Can I repeat that statement? When God is working with Pastor Mulema, whatever it is that I need to do, I will do. When God is with you, you will prosper. When God is with you, he will keep the enemy away from you. When God is with you, there is no devil, there is no demon, there is no disease, there is no power of darkness that will overcome you. Because if God is for us, who is against us? Pastor Simon, when God is with you, there is no sickness that will put you down. This way, even when it looks so impossible, it is possible with God. And I want to declare to you this morning, we need men and women that will walk with God. Our future is not guaranteed by the, the, the small, small experience that we receive here on Sunday. Believe me, Joshua wasn't contented by the fact that he was with Moses. Even after being with Moses, he needed God to give him the ability to take the land which God had promised the children of Israel. This way, three times God told him, Joshua, as I was with Moses, what you saw me do with Moses, the things which our, our elder was reading for us here, and we are saying his mercies endure forever. He said, the same things you, see, you saw me doing with Moses, I will hold your hand and I will do the same. Can I declare to you this afternoon that God will do the same things that he did in your life also. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Maybe you've been going through some difficulties. Maybe there are things which you've been wondering even after all that we have enjoyed here. Is God ever going to do them in my life? Or maybe you've enjoyed a temporary, a, a temporary blessing and you're wondering, can I go further beyond this? Good news for you is this. You're going to gain more territory. But that will not happen for nothing. You must have God walk with you. And that is the message I have for you this morning. To encourage you to let you know God's word for you is this. Don't worry about anything. I will be with you. My presence will go with you. My presence will go with you. These are the same words Jesus used on us. Because believe me, Israel was the church in the wilderness. But today we are the church of Christ in the new covenant. And Jesus understood this. You know, even as he was going to heaven and giving us the great commission. The great commission is basically good news. The good things that we, 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 we have from God. The kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus never left us empty. So he spoke in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, and he gave the church an assurance. Believe me, that promise is for you. An assurance. You know, it's actually a state of mind. Eh? I'm preaching something, but listen to me. If you're going to grasp it, you must change your thinking. You must come to a point where you are convinced beyond doubt. As a child of God, God is with me. So he speaks, he says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I believe most of us here are born again. Are you? Are you born again? Are you baptized? Now he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then he says here, teaching them to do what? To observe all things. Remember Joshua. Moses telling Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. What was he telling Joshua? Listen, as long as you observe the things which I have said, as long as you believe the Bible and you do what the Bible says, he says they are teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. The things which Moses commanded Joshua, they're the same things Jesus is commanding us here. And he's saying, and lo, help me read that in the last verse. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Which means God has given the church a guarantee. You as a believer, you must begin to believe that God is with you. I'm trying to emphasize this. I wish you could see the passion I feel about this in my heart. God is with you. I know it might not be easy. After we leave church, you might find the devil waiting for you outside there. You might find somebody just waiting to draw you back outside there. But the guarantee is this, I will be with you. That's the word which I'm, I'm, I'm looking for here. So not many people can understand this. And I was checking in the Bible. I wanted to get an example of a man in scripture 
Who can demonstrate to us the meaning of the presence of God with you? Because in our thinking, we may think, we may think God comes when we pray, when we call him. That's what we think. And when we cease to pray, God goes to heaven. You know, there are people who think God stays in heaven. And he comes when we invite him to come. Then he's with us when, when, when we invite him. Then after we have finished our prayer, he goes home. Then you begin struggling on your own. But I came to realize God can be with you 24-7. Your actions. Your attitudes. Your thinking. I mean, the way you act. The way you behave. God is with you. In whatever things you are doing, God is with you. In other words, you know for sure, you are convinced beyond any doubt that God is with me in whatever I am doing. I began looking in scripture, believe me. And I realized not many people in the Bible can give us a good example of God being with us. But I saw one man in the scripture whom I love. And I admire him. And I pray God make me like him. This man is none other than a man called Joseph in the Bible. Joseph. It, to some people, it's a story. <laughs> Hear me. To some people, it's just something which is written about a fellow. In, but I looked in the life of Joseph. I realized this is a good example of a man who understood God being with him. Now, the foundation of Joseph's success was found in this word. And I'll read it for you. Through more than three times, God qualified the life of Joseph. More than three times, just like he told Joshua, be courageous. Three times in scripture, God qualified the life of Joseph with his presence. And we can see this in the book of Genesis chapter 39, verse 2. Can we go quickly there? 39 and verse 2. Lord, help me. Genesis 39 and verse 2. And this is what the Bible says. Joseph is this young man, you know, who was sold to Egypt. Okay? It says, the Lord was with Joseph. Can you, can you read with me? That the Lord was where? With Joseph. And says, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now, three times God spoke of Joseph, God being with Joseph. We know Joseph is this young man who has been sold out as a, as a slave. I'm using this example because that's the best example I can show you from the Bible. I know when we use examples of people like David, examples of people like Solomon, maybe Daniel, you may not get the picture here. But Joseph is a man who has been sold as a slave. A slave. A fellow who has nothing. Actually, he was found on the street and somebody bought him on the street. After buying him, he takes him to Egypt and he sells him again there. To a man called Potiphar, who was actually the chief of general staff in the government of King Pharaoh. This man buys him. And he brings him to his house so that he can be able to serve as a servant in his house. So you shift your thinking. Don't look at Joseph as the way you know him. Joseph, the man of God in the Bible, no. Look at this man as a very insignificant person, a servant. Somebody who was of no value to anybody. His job was simply to serve in the, in the house. Then the Bible says, and the Lord was with Joseph. To me, it means this. As long as God is with you, it may not matter. Now hear me right here. Your position does not matter. Amen. Are you listening to me? Yes. Even where you come from does not matter. Yes. You know, today we are people who, who normally say, unless you know somebody. There's this saying, how many do you know somewhere, somewhere there? But I want you to know something you don't need to know anybody. Amen. All you need is God working with you. I wake up in the morning from my, my house, and the moment I know God is on my side, Believe me, as I step out, I know the Lord is with me. And there is nothing that will stand in my way. Just the way he told Joshua in the verse that we read here, you know, we forgot to get something here. He says, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. Meaning there is nothing that will be able to withstand your progress and withstand your prosperity and withstand your blessing all the days of your life. Why? I will be with you. That's the guarantee. God, when you are with me, no devil, no, no demon, no spirit, nothing will stand in my way. Now for Joseph here, the Bible says, the Lord was 
with Joseph. And the scripture says, and he was what? A prosperous man. This man is in the house of Potiphar, his master, but God has already put prosperity into his hands. It means you can be anywhere, but you're prospering there. Am I talking to believers? You can be serving as a house girl, but you're prospering. I know that one doesn't go too well with some people here. Can somebody say amen if you believe what I'm saying? Yeah. You can be working as a clerk in that office, but you are prospering. Yeah. You may just be somebody useless in the eyes of men, but in the eyes of God, you are doing what? Yeah. You are prospering. God was with him, and he was a prosperous man. Then the Bible says, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Let's look at another scripture. Three times he mentioned. If you go to chapter 39 and verse 21, verse 21. 39 and verse 21. It says, and his master, 21, sorry, but the Lord was with Joseph and he showed him mercy and gave him what? Favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Which means this man in the house of Potiphar, Potiphar was the man, the master. God prospered him because God was with him. But now look, the next level of his prosperity is in prison. And I'll talk about that a little later, this man has now moved to prison. Not because he wanted to be in prison. But he has moved in prison because somebody somewhere is trying to make sure or is trying to mess him up because of what God has done in his life. But look at this. Even in prison, you know prison here may mean things which, didn't, which, are, not work, things which are working against you that you never imagined can work against you. But look at this. The Bible says, but the Lord, even in prison, the Lord... Even in prison, the Lord. It means this. Even when the devil tries to put you under. The Lord. The Lord. When people don't like you. When your boss tries to put you down. When your neighbors are against you. When even your family members don't want anything to do with you. The Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. I did what? Showed him what? Mercy. The Bible talks about mercy. And gave him what? Favor. You know, I came to realize when the Lord is with you, favor follows you. Yes. Hear me. Favor is not favor is not what you work for. I, I have received favor in some places. It's not what you work for. Favor is when you go to an office and you knock on that office and you are looking for a job and the fellow looks at you like this and God tells that man employ him. That's favor. Favor is this, you are sitting in an interview panel. You are about eight of you for a job. You know, for jobs, people come when they are very well prepared, eh? dressed up, putting on a good suit, very nice shirt, nice hairstyle if you are a sister there. Your papers, you have arranged them. You know, when you go for an interview, you try to see what your friend is carrying. Some are carrying a very heavy file. And you are carrying only two papers. And you are wondering what is in that file. Have you been in an interview? You know what I'm talking about. Me, I've sat in some. I sit there and I'm just comparing myself. I look at myself and I look at that fellow. The fellow looks so polished. Even the English is very nice. But you, you are walking in with only ESCE. Is it ESCE or what? The, the ones we got, they were called what? ESCE. Mine was ESCE. You are carrying your ESCE and your EACE, your, your certificate. Only two. The fellow has a, a CV. In our days, we didn't have CVs. Curriculum vitae. And he has arranged it so nicely with so many other certificates attached. Okay? Then they go in one by one and you are watching and you are the last one. When you appear, you are just one, you, actually your heart is telling you the job is done what? It's gone. But when the fellows look at you like this, even the way you walk in, you know, after you've walked in, your face may not be having, you know, yeah, makeup. You know? It may just be natural. But let me tell you, when they see you, something happens. I mean, they see an angel walking in. You, you are just natural. And I can tell you, natural sometimes is good. Those are the things that you put on your faces, I can tell you. Sometimes they make you look like a devil, let me tell you. You know, some people, let me tell you, you only need God. If you need God, you don't need those things. You just walk in with your natural beauty like that and stand there. Because what will happen, the Bible says, and God showed him what? Mercy. Then he gave him what? Who gave him? God or who? God. I'm imagining a slave. This is a slave. Already the, the master loves the slave. 
the master. But for some reasons, he's in prison. But even in prison, the prison warder, the man who was in charge of the prison, the boss of the prison, he just, Joseph just walks in like this, and the man looks at Joseph, and the Bible says God gave him favor. It was not anything Joseph worked for. Let me tell you, when God is with you, you don't need to do anything. I'm not telling you you wake up with your, in your pajamas and you go to knock somebody's office. No. All you need to do, just be yourself. Be the best that you can be. Then walk there and believe God for his favor. For his favor. They will look at you and, and something will happen. They will begin to, I mean, they'll just be, when you just walk in, you are lovely. They will just love you. And by the time you're walking out, they're saying, that is the person you want to give a job. That's the meaning of the word favor. So even in prison, God gave this man favor. I'm telling you one thing. The favor was because God was with him. It was not the makeup. I don't know whether you're getting my point. It was not because he knew anybody in prison. No, 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 no. There was somebody in his life that made Joseph different. That's the man I'm talking about. Momentum won't come because you know pastor. It will not come because of hard work. Momentum comes because there is somebody in you whom you have made your central person in your life. And that man gives you mercy and that man gives you what? Favor. It didn't end there. He's still gaining momentum. But I'll put it in perspective later. Look at chapter 41, verse 38. 41, verse 38. A few more minutes. That one, verse 48. It says, And Pharaoh said to his servants, Pharaoh now, we moved away from the Potiphar. Potiphar was the chief of general staff. We've gone to prison. The man is still with God. And now he has left prison. He is now in the palace of Pharaoh. Okay? The scripture tells me this. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Please help me read that portion of scripture. It says, can we find such a one as this is? A man in whom the spirit of God is. Remember, Pharaoh has just been with his uh, 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 astrologer, astrologers. Astrologers. He has been with his, uh, you know, sorcerers. He has tried on anybody who, who was of, of value to him to interpret his dream. He has tried, even the witches were there. Anybody you can think of. His smart men, men of knowledge, they were all there. His professors, the people who advised him were there. Suddenly, this young man who is in prison, emerges out of prison. They say, Pharaoh needs you. The young man, I'm trying to imagine the way he was looking. Okay? He shaves, put, put, puts on a new dress, and he appears before Pharaoh. And when the man opens his mouth to begin talking, the Bible tells me Pharaoh looked at him. And Pharaoh asked a question, which I believe when you ask that question, it means you have tried everything else you can and you've realized there is no answer. He said, can we find such a one? A man like this. Then he qualifies what was with that man. A man in whom the spirit of God is, dwells. And that's the epitome of everything. Working with God is when the spirit of God is present in you every time. You didn't hear me. This, this is a brother or a sister who is full of the Holy Ghost. A man who has his antennas raised up to hear what the Holy Ghost is saying. This is a man and a woman whom when somebody says something, the Holy Ghost will speak before he, he acts. This is a man or a woman who listens and is careful and attentive to the voice of God. Whom God is holding in the hand. And God is his friend and is talking to him. Pharaoh saw that spirit in Joseph. And he says, can we find a man like this in whom the spirit of God is? Now church, let me finish by telling you this. If I left my sermon here, I would just be hyping you. Like some of you are already hyped. Amen, hallelujah. <laughs> but let me tell you, there is something about Joseph which we must know. That made God walk with him. And I can assure you, and I'm speaking without controversy here, it is not just by saying amen. There must be something in you that will attract the presence of God in your life. Amen. Let me speak slowly. You won't gain momentum because you sang in the worship team during the conference. Because somebody told me I was so blessed to be part of the worship team. And I said, okay. All right. At least another one came and told me, at least I was seen on the video. 
which means everybody saw her in the video. That doesn't give you momentum. It does not give you momentum because you served during the conference, no. It won't give you momentum because somebody laid hands on you and they blessed you, no. There are certain things that always attract God in your life. You know, how? I, 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 wish, I, I wish I could cut myself and give you what is it. You know, sometimes I always wish that I could just open up and take everything and cut you and place in you and close. Then you go thinking the way I was thinking. Let me tell you, Enoch was just like any other ordinary man. In fact, even the Bible tells me oh, Enoch was ordinary. Elijah was ordinary. But there was something, can somebody say something? About this man that attracted heaven. And this is what Paul, I mean, Moses was telling Joshua. He was telling Joshua, God will be with you if this book of the law, this Bible that we are holding, this book of the law, if you will meditate on this book, day, let me ask a question. When you wake up in the morning, what book do you land, your hand lands on first? Can you ask your neighbor? I'm about to finish. What is the first thing that you reach out to? Please tell your neighbor. What is the first thing you reach out to? Up there, tell your neighbor. Is it the book? Is it this book? I'm sure he has told you the truth, isn't it? I hope he didn't lie to you because I can tell you what he told you. Today, people don't reach out to the Bible as their first thing in the morning. What do they reach out to? May the Lord rebuke that phone in the name of Jesus. If you are a lawyer, say Shindwe. Then say Rushua. Because the phone has become a demon. For some of us who used to wake up in the morning and we take the Bible and we read. These days the first thing is phone. And on the phone, what is the first thing? You, the, the, the first place you go to? Kumbe, they know. You can hear them preaching with me. Now today, people are living, they are meditating on WhatsApp day and night. Even when you are going to bed, the, first, the last thing you look at is your is you are what is up? Then when you, once you're finished with what, what's up, the next one is which one? Facebook. After Facebook? After Twitter? Is after Instagram? And then you want to, to gain more territory. How can you gain more territory with those things? And you will agree with me, everything we are seeing on social media is nothing but trash. Am I saying the truth? You go put your TV on at night. You will see up to a half the news. Are people who are committing rape, people who have killed one another, people who are in prison, corruption, people who are speaking against each other. By the time they speak one good thing, one hour is over. And that's the trash which believers are feeding on day and night. Can I speak to you? Can I speak to you? Can I speak to you? The word of God is telling you, let God be first in your life. You didn't hear me. Let me come this side because that side seems to be more excited than this side. I'm saying no more phone. Some of you are looking at me now because I know the phone is already in your pocket. It's already doing some things. Even in, in church, we put it on silent, isn't it? And it keeps on nagging you. You know, it's just telling you. You know, we need to come to the point where the people of God will know where their strength is coming from we'll begin to realize that there are so much things God has in store for us, which the devil is taking away from us. And one of those things are these things that we are discussing here and we are talking about here. Moses told Joshua, this book of the law, the Bible, the book of the law, shall not depart out of, but you will do what? How long do you meditate on it? Is it only once when you come to church? I don't want to do a census, but I know some of you, you looked at the Bible today. And you will look at it next Sunday. Am I saying the truth, Pastor? After, after this service, you're going to put it somewhere and say, wait until next Sunday when Pastor Malema will be preaching. But I can tell you, if you want to progress in life, if you want God to move you to the next level, if you want to become a man and a woman of God, meditate on this book day and night. And he says, and be careful to do all what is written. Not just meditating. But when you're going to the office, what are you doing? All what is written where? 
in the Bible. Let me use these five minutes to tell you. There are things which made Joseph attractive. And I have called them in my notes here. There are five of them. I will mention only one. I'll visit the other one some other time. Five of them. What I call as the test of momentum. Things which God must try you on for you to gain momentum. And I'll speak again to you. Even in this church today, you will not make any progress until God has tested you in those things. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. Simon spoke here and he says we are just norm, we are also human beings. You know, people don't think even pastors fall sick, Simon. You people, when you see us, you think at Hwangu Wagonjo. It's only that we can't tell you. Simon, it's Nikweli. Sometimes we are sick, but we are not sick. Am I saying the truth, Pastor? I am not sick. I am not sick. I am not sick. So then I can't tell you, Pastor, I am not sick. I am not sick. I am not sick. I'm telling you. But you know what? The same things you go through, we go through. Joseph was just like you. But the man understood, I need God with me every time. Amen. As much as he was the leader, he had God with him. Joshua needed God for him to help Israel inherit the land. It wasn't anybody else. God told Moses, tell him he's the one. And some of us, God has called us to be the ones to help you. So if we cannot be able to take God with us, and walk with us, how will you pick that God whom we are preaching? There were four things. The tests. And one of those tests, the first test, let me mention it here. It was the test of what I call as test of character. There are four. Let me mention them, then I'll talk about character and I'll finish. The test of character. Number two, the test of faithfulness and hard working. Number three, the test of uh, relationships. And number four, the test of dependence on God. And finally, the test of the times and the seasons we are living in. Five things that God has to test every man for him to move to his level, the next level. And Joseph wasn't an exception. Even as much as God was with him, God wanted to test Joseph and see, I am with you always, but can you pass this test? The test of character. Test of character. And I defined character. I said character here is the aggregate of futures and traits that form the individual nature of some person or something. The aggregate of futures of, uh, and traits that form my nature as an individual. In other words, there are things in me, there are traits in me, there are characters in me. There are things in me that form me and make me me. Those are the things which God wants to deal with in our lives. Until we have a character that speaks of God, that loves God, that speaks of God's goodness, until we have a character that displays God. In fact, character, if I would put here, is summarized in only one word, integrity. The word integrity means adherence to moral and ethical principles. Soundness of moral character. And honesty. Let me repeat myself here. It is simply moral or ethical behavior. Until God has tested me in my behavior, especially my moral behavior, my ethical behavior, I can tell you nothing will attract God in my life. And I'll finish by telling you this. The biggest challenge today in the church is our moral and our ethical behavior doesn't attract God in our lives at all. I think you're quiet. Can I repeat myself? Yes. Turn to your friend, tell him moral, moral. Ethical, ethical, behavior. Yes. Okay. It doesn't attract God in our lives. We come to church, we sing after we are done here. A number of us who are singing here and are very happy here, when they go outside that gate, they're, they're going to be tested. And after being tested, what? Are you going to pass the test? Joseph was a, a young man who loved God. And as much as God was with him, he allowed him to be tested. Believe me, Potiphar. Potiphar, this man, the chief of general staff. The Bible tells me he trusted this young man so much. To an extent that this young man, Potiphar, didn't even care what was going on in his house. Because the man was a man of God. You'll find this in chapter 39, verse 3 to verse 6. Let's read that scripture. 
Then I'll stop at that. 39 verse 3 to verse 6. Are you still with me? I'm a Mehama. How many are still with me in the house? I'm just about to conclude. All right, listen. He says, and his master. Who is this his master here? Potiphar. Potiphar, the first place where he was a slave. It says, so, help me here. What did he see? What did he see? Come on, can you preach with me here? Tell your friend what Potiphar saw. The Lord was... In other words, when Potiphar looked at Joseph, he saw the Lord. The Lord was with him. Just like when people see you and you say you are born again, they see the Lord in you. They say that brother is born again, that sister is born again. The Lord was with him. And then he says, and that the Lord, what did the Lord do? He made all things that he did to prosper in his hand. When God is with you, everything you do prospers. Let's move on. Verse 4. And Joseph found what? Grace and in his sight and served him and he made him what? Overseer over his house and all that he had, he put it in the hand of Joseph. Meaning this man looked at Joseph as slave. You put yourself there. Can I cascade it down? That house girl you have in your house, that house boy who serves you, the chamberman, you take everything you have, you put it in his hands, and you make him overseer over your house. How many of you can do that? And especially house girls, how many can you, can you allow to be in charge? Okay, let's move on. Verse, verse 4, verse 5. And it came to pass at that time that he had made him overseer in his house that, and over all that he had. What did God do? The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for whose sake? You know what that means? It means when God blesses you, you become a blessing. And I'm coming to a point here which I'll end on. I ended on the same in the first service. Many of us don't realize the blessings of God. And please bear with me, I'm your pastor. Even after this, you will still love me. I know you will. I've, built, I've already built rapport with you. So there's no problem. So please bear with me. Even some of you who have house girls in your homes. Me, I'm sharing because I'm a married man. My daughter is here. She's now big. I have seen them come and go. In fact, I agreed with Nelly. In the business of house girls, I have no portion. That is your work. You have the power to hire and to do what? In fact, I never come any close. I see them come and I see them go. And they have no reason to explain, to even to ask why they did what? You try it as a man. I know there are men who like to question, why is she going? What has she done? You go and try it and you will know. You will tell me, you'll come and give a testimony. And I know the reason why. I'm giving you this challenge because I want to speak well about house girls. I want you to know God can also use your house help. I know now women are looking at me with bad eyes. Because some of you this morning, you fired one, isn't it? But look here, the Bible says God did what? Blessed whose house? Uh -uh, can you shout, whose house? For whose sake? Who was Joseph? Wasn't he a house boy? But look at this man. Because God is with him. The Lord said, even the master whom you are serving, I will bless your master. And because of that, the Egyptian, look at what the Bible says. He was blessed. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Which means everything which was happening in that home was multiplying. Simply because there was one little boy in that house who was with the Lord. Can I speak to the members of GCI here? Yeah. Now listen, brethren, if you will appreciate even house girls who love Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Am I talking to believers here? Yeah. Why are the sisters a bit quiet? See, I've told you our position as men. Yeah. All right? Now listen, we even have some in the, in the house here who serve in our homes. It's, it's upon you to bring that person to Jesus. Yeah. And help that person know Jesus. If that person knows Jesus, the blessing of your house will increase. Yeah. You don't know what I'm talking about. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Now this man, his house is now being blessed because of a man, a boy who was serving there. And God remembers, I am with this man. I am blessing him because of this man who is in his house. 
a mistake that many of us don't consider. You know, Joseph, a houseboy, how do you think he looked? How do you think Joseph looked? Especially the outside appearance. Sisters who have house, house assistants, you know. How do you want her to dress? Even if she has the best in the house. Supposing you arrived at home and you found she's dressing in those things that show. And your husband is there, what will you do? Even her, she's put on her Sunday best, what would you do? So you fire her. You want her to look like a what? I'm provoking your mind to think. I'm telling you, if, if we went by our standards, Joseph would have been dressed like a servant. But you read the Bible and see verse 6. Can you go to verse 6? Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says this. And he left, can you help me here? He left what? All that he had in Joseph's hands. And he took, he knew not what he ought to have had, save the bread which he ate, and Joseph was what? Help me there. A goodly person, a goodly person and what? Well favored. It means when you saw Joseph, it is, it, despite of him dressing like a servant, he was handsome. Let me speak to you. Even if your boss doesn't see you the way you are supposed to be, you want him to see you. Even if you appear in that clerk's dress, even if you appear in that servant's dress, God will make you goodly. Yeah. Are you not listening to me? Yeah. And he will make you goodly and what? Yeah. Well favored. It means Joseph, whenever he appeared like this, beauty came out of him. Ah, yeah. uh, you're not getting my point. I'm saying this, whenever Joseph appeared like this, something happened. Yeah. Just like the favor I've talked about. Everybody saw a good man. Good man, goodly. Even God changed his face. I'm sure even the, 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 the boss favored him to a point where he allowed him to put on anything he wanted to put on. But can I tell you, even with all those blessings, there was still a test of character. And I want you to, I want you to know something. You will be tested in your character. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. Joseph was a spiritual man here because God was with him. But there was still, in the environment he was in, there was still the test of character. That's what I want to preach to you this afternoon. And to tell you, as you go where you are going, be careful. Because what will be tested first, the first entry point for possessing more territory, is the test of your character. Ask me, Pastor Mulema, how do you know that? The same chapter 39, verse 7. We are almost done, verse 7. It says it came to pass after those things that his master's wife cast her eye upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. What an opportunity. <laughs> this, 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 this is the boss's wife. Now look at the description of what we have read here. Joseph is a man who is well favored. He's in charge. The, the, even the wife does not know what the husband has. It means this woman, her job was just to sit back and she's dressed nicely. Anafanyua nyuele. Anatengenezua. Mudomo. Sindio. Anawekwa ile naituanga nini? Foundation. Anavalishwa zile nguwa muzuri. And the woman is just there. She doesn't care about anything because even the food that the man ate she didn't, the Bible says even the food. Who was in charge of the food? Joseph. Everything was Joseph. Joseph was everything. So the lady was just to sit there to be pampered. To be spoiled, if I could use the word. But you know, in the midst of all that, God wants to test the character of this man that he is with. And whom does God use to test? The wife. The wife comes and he says, gentlemen, you know, you, you look so nice. Can I have you? Let me ask the men who are here. If you are given such an opportunity, how many of you would not take? <laughs> Can men be sincere? What kind of idea would that be? Wouldn't it be a good idea? I'm trying to imagine this woman was telling Joseph, now that you know uh, we love you so much in this house, now, once we've done this, you can take over everything. I'm giving to you everything. Okay? 
And I can tell you, that is where we need God in our lives. God is using a man here. But let me tell you, even women, the same. She tried Joseph. I'm a, the Bible doesn't tell me she did it once. Maybe when you try once, people will say it was an accident. But I can tell you, she went to Joseph and says, can we lie together? The man of God says, no, I can't lie with you. She went again, can we lie together? I'm imagining every time she went, she had a scheme. Maybe the second time she went naked. But the man of God still resisted. But he never gave up. Some of us were tested today. Oh, pastor, that man, there's a man in my office who's been disturbing me. Me, I'm quitting that job. Don't quit that job. You didn't hear me. These are things we hear. Pastor Ken will tell you. Simon will tell you. He's been touching me and touching me. Pastor, please pray for me. I'm quitting. Don't quit. Prove to him. You didn't hear me? Prove to him that there is a God in heaven who can give you the character that can out to do. You don't, you don't get my point here. Joseph never quit. Joseph was there. She tried again and again. And the man of God would tell her, no. I'll tell you what he would tell her. You go to verse 37, 38 and see. 38 says this. Joseph told her. He refused. And he said to her master's wife, Behold, my master does not, know what is in, um, does not know what is with me in the house. In other words, everything I know, your master doesn't even know. He says, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. But look at verse 39. 39 I, mean, I mean verse 9. Verse 9. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither has he kept back anything from me but what? But you. Then he says, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against you? Against God. He was a principled man. A man of character. Preach for me. Tell, turn to your neighbor, ask him, are you that man? What answer did you receive? Did he say yes or no? Upstairs, can you ask them, are you that man? I didn't see people upstairs there. What answer have you received? Can I tell you the greatest sin that we have in church today is not drinking. It's the sin of character. And let me tell you, it will not end even now after you leave this service. There is somebody out there waiting for you. Anointed. The message was very nice. But someone will be there, can you lie with me? Will you say no or will you say yes? The test of what? Can somebody say character? How much can I believe you that you are a woman and a man of integrity if you cannot pass the test of character? Do you know this woman tried and tried and tried until she did a scheme. And the scheme was simple. I will send people out to do errands for me. Let me send others to the market. Let me send others there. Then I remain with Joseph alone in the house. I know brethren. I know them. Can we organize for a seminar? Naivasha. They plan a seminar. And in that seminar, they know. In that seminar, she'll be there. When everybody else is not seeing us, we have a saying this, character is tested when you are alone. When you are alone. We will send, we will go out there alone when we are alone doing our own things. Only that time I can be able to get her. That's what she did. She prepared for a seminar in, 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 in Naivasha. It's in the Bible. Look at verse 11. It says, and it came to pass about that time, Joseph went into a house to do his business and there was none of the men in the house. Where were the men? Now you think, tell us, where, where were the, the other men? The woman began sending some, you go to the market. You go and buy me this. You go and plow the land. And then he left Joseph alone in the house. That the Bible tells me none of the men were there with him in the house. Like verse 12 says, at that particular time, she caught him by his garment. And she said, lie with me. This is now rape. Lie with me. The Bible tells me, and he left his garment in his hand. And, and did what? Akakimbia. The woman was funny. She would have held him tight. But she held the, the coat. 
So he left the garment. He says, you keep the garment. And Joseph ran out. When he, she realized Joseph has run out, she began crying. She says, Ooh, the man was raping me. I've even taken his coat. And she didn't know she was moving Joseph to the next level. And that's the level that we've spoken about where he found grace and favor in the prison. Let me tell you, you will not get it right just the first time. Look, pass the test of integrity. Then you'll move to the next level. Worship team, come. Pass the test of integrity. Then you'll move to where? May the Lord help the church this afternoon. If you are among those who are scheming, if you are among those who are being caught up in the web of, uh, you know, this type of corruption I'm talking about, may God give you the grace. You will never move to the next level. When you have not passed the first test, the test of integrity. And I'll say this without any hesitation. That is the biggest cancer that we have today in the church. Am I saying the truth? I hope you still love me. I am still your pastor. But if we are going to heaven together, we must pass the test of may God bless you. Can we stand up on our feet? We'll talk about the others in, the, in, in some days to come. Test of integrity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you praise. Just lift up your hands to Jesus. May God be with you. Lift up your hands to, to Jesus. Take a moment and just worship him. Tell him to have mercy on you. Father, we are, pray, we are praying this day. Lord, many of us have not passed any tests of integrity in our lives. We've wanted you to go with us wherever we are going. But we have allowed the things of this world. We've allowed the things of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. We've allowed, Lord Jesus, the problems that we are faced with, the environments that we are operating in, to affect us. Father, the last time we spoke here, we spoke about Lot and Achan. This man that stood in the way of Israel, entering the land of Canaan, because they allowed the first test of integrity to fail in their lives. I pray this, this afternoon, Lord Jesus, that you will speak to us. If there are people amongst us, and I believe they are, that Lord have succumbed to this test and failed to pass it, may you in your own divine way reveal yourself to us, O oh God, that Lord, we may learn how to allow your presence to be with us in our lives. How we can move into the land that you are giving us to take that land. Teach us, Lord. Speak to us, dear Father. Speak to your people this afternoon. Let the Holy Spirit convict us and convince us. Let the Word of God speak to our minds, our spirits, our souls, our bodies. Help us, dear Father, to know without you we can do nothing. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, God, speak to your people this day. If there are some who are struggling, struggling in their lives, struggling in their environments, they want to move to the next level, but they can't because there are things in their lives which, Lord, they have succumbed to. Some of us that love you, but yet we've allowed the devil to speak into our lives, Lord, and we've allowed him to take part of our lives, oh, my Father. In the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, speak to us this afternoon. Change our thinking, change our minds. Change the way we do things, oh God. Give us the spirit that you gave Joseph. That we may learn how to say no to sin. How to say no to unrighteousness. How to say no to wickedness. We may learn how to obey the voice of every word that you've spoken to us in your word. We may meditate on the word of God day and night and refuse the seducing spirits that have been released in the media and in the air. This day, Lord Jesus, we submit ourselves to you our mind, our spirit, our souls, our bodies, and all that is within us, oh God. I pray for the church, the body of Christ. I pray for this congregation that you put under my care. In the name of Jesus, have mercy. Let the grace of God come upon your people. Let the favor of God come upon their lives, oh God. And teach us to be like Joseph, to be like Joshua, to be like those men that obeyed your voice and walked in righteousness, that you may move us in the land of our possession the land that you are giving to us, O oh Father. 
in our homes, in our businesses, in our marriages, in our individual work that we are doing, in our relationships, oh my Father, in the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves to you, Lord. And we pray for your peace. We pray for your favor. We pray for your guidance. We pray, Lord God, that you will speak to each and every person and help us to overcome every temptation that comes our way. Hallelujah. We give you the glory. And we give you the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.